Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. My guest today is Steve LaPlume. I've had Steve on in the past. He talked about some of his experiences uh, prior to and leading up to his experiences uh, in Reynolds from Forest, uh, RAF Bent Waters, and he talked a bit about his, his career post Rendlesham. So uh, I thought I'd bring Steve back and have Steve talk about a number of other issues that we're all interested in. So without any further ado, Steve LaPlume, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on. Oh, anytime, Steve. Well, tell me, uh, what's been going on at your end? And uh, what have you been doing since we last spoke? Um, I'm I'm building an off grid house right now, and um, I'm 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 doing a cordwood wall, so it's uh, pretty labor intensive. So I've got two more walls to go out of the sixteen sections of it. So getting ready to finish that up and get my solar power hooked up and get that all squared away. So look well, good. Nothing like being self sufficient, especially with the reality of the rural situation and and how we're already experiencing price increases for goods and services all across the board, energy, yep. uh, charges, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all tied in with this world situation and, and, and what's going on domestically in America. So good on you for yep. getting your family prepared. Yeah, we were, uh, my daughter lives on the front part of the property and I've got my house back down in the, in the valley or what they call a hauler here in uh, Kentucky. So, um, um, I mean, I literally have deer walking around my house while I'm building it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so oh, that is cool. I, I, I could probably go hunting off my back porch, you know. But, uh, but um, yeah, so we've got a homestead that we started here. So we were raising goats and chickens, and we're going to be getting some pigs and quail. Yeah, I see some critters quail. behind you. What are those? Some what? I see some oh. animals behind you, critters. Yeah, I've got some, uh, my daughter's got some quail behind us over here. Oh, okay. So she, she raises quail and sells them and, uh, yeah. So she's, I do all the infrastructure and she's in charge of raising and selling the animals. So oh, nice. Yeah. So, so we're doing that, you know, we've got chickens and all that. And then, um, we're getting our gardens going this spring. So I'm just getting that all squared away. So Look good. Yeah, trying to be self-sufficient as possible. And then I live in an Amish community, so. If the power ever goes down, it's not a big deal around here. <laughs> so. Well, they already have a well-established barter type system, uh, networking yep. uh, in their own yep. community. Mm -hmm. so, this is my skipper key that we were talking about. Hey, puppy, how are you? <laughs> this is Black Betty. You know, remember that song by Ram Jam? Ram Black Jam. Betty? Yeah, how can I yep. forget? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is Black Betty. <laughs> I just call her Betty, but yeah, she's my little sidekick here. So she might yeah. jump on my lap from time to time. <laughs> oh, that's quite all so, right. Uh, yep. So, yeah, so been doing that. Um, I know we talked about um, UFOs. I get a little burned out on doing UFO podcasts and stuff like that. So um, that's why I suggested maybe we ought to do a little paranormal. I worked yeah. I worked a couple times with uh, Paul and Ben Eno over on the, on the East Coast. They've got a, a radio show and they let me uh, guest host a couple times. So it was always kind of neat to do some paranormal stuff and you know, just as a change of pace, you know? Oh, well, so. let's hear it because I know that I, I've heard some negative commentary. Well, you know, so-and-so claims they've had alien abduction experiences. They also said they've seen Bigfoot. They've had ghostly phenomena. How could so many things happen to a single person? Well, I'm here to say those things do happen. I don't know yeah. if it's because some people have a partic particular, um, I, I don't know, sense of, uh, sensitivity or predisposition is the right word, or they just mm -hmm. seem to have a, a level of awareness where they recognize things. Because as you know, Steve, some people can report the most fantastic UFO sightings, but think nothing of it. It, it, it would be so unusual that they put the whole experience on the back corridors of, of their consciousness and in their memory, and they don't think about it. That when you Ask them to explain what they experienced. The out comes this phenomenal story. May even have hints of missing time there, but uh, mm -hmm. people are so habituated to, you know, not want to put these things into context and delve deeply into them. And you know, I, because I know in my own personal life, especially when I was in high school, I had so many uh, paranormal experiences. I thought I was being haunted. My mm. mom was a Roman uh, Catholic. 
So there was mm -hmm. always a crucifix around the house or something, right? So I yep. resorted yep. to the um, tactic of laying a crucifix sitting atop a Bible on the nightstand next to my bed because I thought it would somehow protect me, right? So definitely, yeah, yeah, I'd like yeah. to hear your, your thoughts on, on the paranormal and how it ties into all this. Well, I, I've only had the one UFO incident was Rendlesham Forest. I might have seen something goofy in the sky once or twice, but probably satellites when I was a kid and didn't know what I was looking at type thing, you know. But um, so I don't think I really have a preponderance for UFO incidents. It was just that one time I saw what I saw over at Rendlesham Forest. But uh, um, when it comes to paranormal, I've had a few experiences and I don't think I get a magnetism towards it. I think it was just the house houses that we happen to live in. Um, my dad bought a old Victorian house that was built. I think it was built in the 1830s, 1836, if I remember right. And um, uh, where, where I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, the, the town's called Lemonster, Mass. And it's where Johnny Appleseed was born. And um, it, it was actually, it's very well documented that it was, um, what are those called? Uh, abolitionist town. Mm -hmm. So when they dug up the Holiday Inn, they found some caverns, <laughs> I guess you'd call it, or some tunnels, and they went and explored them, and they went from house to house, and that's where they would hide slaves, and they'd, they'd bring them from one house to the next house through these tunnels. And a lot of the homeowners didn't even know that that bricked-up area in their basement was actually a secret passageway to somebody else's house. So... Um, so when we bought this house, it was really dilapidated and we had to fix it up quite a bit. And we found that there was a, a passageway from the first floor all the way up to the top floor. So you'd have a ladder going up there and you, I guess they'd hide slaves up in the eaves, up in the attic area and stuff like that. And, uh, when we first got that house, I remember it was 1971 and I was 11 years old and it was three stories with a basement and, uh, we went first floor was just living room, kitchen, that sort of stuff. Second floor had a master bedroom with the bathroom. And then there were two bedrooms with a, a common bathroom. And then there was a doorway. And my mom said, you've got the whole third floor to yourself. I was like, all right, cool. She said, there's two rooms up there. I'm going to make one a sewing room. And the other big room is a bedroom and that's yours. And I opened up the door and the stairs went up and there was a landing and went up a little more. And I got about halfway up those stairs and got the heebie-jeebies on me. I don't know. All of a sudden, I just went, whoa. And I felt something like there was a ghost or a present. And I never went up. I never made it to, to up there to see. <laughs> you know, when we were doing a tour of the house, I never got up there to see where my bedroom was. I just went, whoa, there's something screwy up here. And I went back downstairs. But, uh, you know, eventually we moved in. And I, I just really didn't think much of it afterwards. But there was some weird stuff going on in that house. There was some sort of a ghost or a present. Um, both my uh, future brother-in-law, he stayed with us for a while, uh, just before he married my sister. And uh, my mom said, well, hey, you know, he's going to stay over here in the other room. And he didn't last, I think, two weeks in that room. And he ended up coming over and we moved the bed over and he stayed in my room with me. And I found out years later the reason was because every morning at three o'clock in the morning, the little boy would wake him up at the end of the bed saying, help me. <laughs> and it scared the crap out of him. So, um, but there was something going on there. I remember um, years before that happened, I turned the light off and went to bed. Then the light turned back on. I was like, huh. I turned the light off, lay back down. The light would turn back on. I was, All right. So finally I gave up and I said, fine, leave the light on. And when I woke up in the morning, the light was off, stuff like that. And, uh, um, my dad would take in people all the time. My, my dad had a real rough upbringing. He would get kicked out of his house when he was like 11 or 12 years old and put out on the street because his dad remarried and the new wife was like, Hey, they're not my kids. So you know, he got booted. So, um, so he always had a, a soft spot for kids living on the street. So I've got, I think five foster sisters and a foster brother he would bring in, you know, just whoever, whenever. And one of these girls, was in there and she always complained that my little sister would go up and mess up her room and my little sister just kept it wasn't me i never did that blah 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 and she just kept denying that she would ever go up there and mess around with this girl's makeup and that sort of thing and um i remember when uh i believe it was my my younger sister just a year younger than me 
Uh, and then I got a kid sister that's six years younger than me, and she's the one that was always getting accused of messing up the room. So, uh, um, so my sister Donna was graduating, and we all left and went out to eat. And we came back. Gabriel comes downstairs and says, man, I told you not to mess up my room, blah, blah, blah. And all her makeup was like, like somebody took a hand and just wiped off her makeup off their, her makeup table. And my mom's like, Gabe, she was like the first one in the car. <laughs> so it wasn't her. So um, just weird stuff like that would happen. Um, my dad worked nights. He was a cop. And uh, he would always say that, yeah, I'd, you know, he'd come home and he'd sit down in the lazy boy. and He never made it to bed. He'd always just sack out with the lazy boy you know, while we were at school. And uh, he'd always be like, yeah, I heard somebody walking upstairs. I heard a door close, that sort of thing. So, so there was something going on in that house. And there was a couple other houses close by that were like known to be haunted houses type thing, you know? But, um, so that was like my first experience with ghosts and paranormal and, um, yeah, you just always some sort of weird present in that house. So, I mean, like the dog would sit down for somebody that wasn't there, you know, that sort of thing. So, did uh, your brother-in-law describe what the little boy looked like? Was it a little black was, child and a little white child? No, it was weird. It was a little white boy. It wasn't. A, you would think it'd be a black slave child, but it wasn't. It was a white boy. So I'm just wondering. Back in the day, you know, there was a lot of disease. People would die all the time. Young, you know, young kids would always die of cholera, or you know, maybe it was a Spanish flu back then. I, I have no idea. I know that the people that owned the house originally were called the Cooks. And they're a very well-to-do family. This is like an old Victorian type house, you know. And they're a well-to-do family. But um, I don't know the history of the house. It gone through, you know, quite a few hands before we got it. So, um, are there any like yeah. uh, hot or cold spots around the house? Well, besides there's where all the stuff seemed to be going on. Did, did you ever feel like sudden drafts and chills? No, no, I never felt anything like that. I mean despite the fact that it had no insulation and we had to get it re-insulated. Once that happened, there wasn't any, any more wind whipping through the walls. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I don't think we ever felt anything like that, but it was, it was that third floor definitely had, had the heebie jeebies up there all the time. So, it makes you wonder if, yeah. if it was just the boy that ha whatever misfortune befell the boy, or if there was something else going on that preceded the boy and the boy just kind of added on to whatever was already going on. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was I was always on the impression something happened and that kid either died in the house or, you know, maybe maybe he was abused and his he got beaten to death in the house or something. I have no idea, no no clue. But yeah, he would always three in the morning he'd wake up Mark and just say help me. And finally, wow. Mark was like, "I'm out of here." Yeah, I've had <laughs> enough know? of this. Yeah, yeah. I haven't slept in two weeks, so <laughs> yeah. So he moved into my room and. Never had any trouble in my room, which was right next door to that room. So, and I've stayed in that room before, and I never had any experience. So, I don't know why Mark, you know, why this kid was always showing up at, at Mark, but it might have been because Mark had uh, uh, maybe his energy because his dad, Mark's dad, was abusive. That's why he was staying with us before he married my sister. He got kicked out of the house, and uh -huh. he always had a problem with his dad. So, yeah. oh, okay, might have been something like that. So, so maybe he had a. Uh, like I said, just a negative energy that that entity could uh, relate to. Yeah, some sort so, of sympathetic resonance that the, yeah, uh, the yeah. entity could, uh, you know, like you said, attach yeah. itself to. In yeah. the, the home that I lived in in San Jose, California, it seemed to be uh, like, I don't know if haunted is the right word, but there was some apparition of, of a tall man with a, with a dark suit. And... Hmm. At first, we were kind of, you know, scared and trepidatious of the whole thing, right? Because on, on one occasion, I was standing in the kitchen, and my younger brother was walking into the kitchen, and suddenly he was startled and, and jumped back, right? I go, what's going on? And he said, suddenly, this big man, oh, and simultaneous to him jumping back, right? Our German mm -hmm. shepherd at the time, Matt, growled and got into a, like a an aggressive posture, right? Oh. Yeah. And so I go, well, what's going on? It's, he said, this man just appeared right here, right? And there were other things that would go on, like uh, we had an addition built behind uh, our our house. It was kind of like an extra family room with, with an extra bedroom, kind of an annex to it. 
So they didn't knock out the entire uh, pre-existing wall where the kitchen was for, for whatever reason. So there was still a window that you could sit at the bar stool uh, at the bar at, at, you know, fronting the kitchen and look through a rear window into that extra room. Right. And you can mm -hmm. see my bedroom from sitting there. Oh, okay. Uh, and so I'm, I walk out from another part of the house and my, my parents are both sitting there facing towards the window and looking at my bedroom door. I walk up behind them from a different part of the house. They get all spooked. I go, what's the matter? They go, didn't you just walk into your bedroom? No, I was coming from the garage, right? So hmm. people were seeing different things. And eventually my mom, she just decided, well, the guy must be a friend, okay? Or, or nice at, at any rate, because he's mm -hmm. not hurting us. He's not harming us. And after a while, I guess this is just her way of coping or whatever, but she decided that it was kind of a friendly kind of uh, benign spirit that just happened to have some kind of connection to the house. And so yeah. with me, I, I never knew because there was some degree of fudge factor in hindsight looking back because I know for people that have alien abduction encounters, they do at times go through stretches of paranormal activity. So hmm. it, sometimes it's, because you know, a fudge factor was it more of was the phenomena I just experienced more related to some kind of like ghostly phenomena or was it somehow related to the ET thing? Because uh, yeah, I which, had which came yeah, first, the chicken or the egg, right? That's right. So I had things like yeah. that same room that I'd mentioned uh, that my parents were looking at when they saw some apparition walk into it. I remember I was going to meet some friends and we're going to have some beers at a, at a local park you know, throw a football or a frisbee or a baseballs around or whatever, listen to tunes. And, uh, you know, I'm just getting ready to go out. It's Saturday morning, right? And mm -hmm. so I walk out that bedroom door and it had a deadbolt on it, right? So I walk out and I close the door behind me and I clearly hear the deadbolt slide shut and, and, and you know, close itself, right? And so I turn around, oh, that what is this? And I try to get in, and I can't do it. Oh, well, I'm not going to worry about it now. I'm sure I can get in later. Went out, hung mm -hmm. out with friends, came back later on. Long story short, I had to take the door off the hinges in order to get inside, right? And then put oh. the hinges. And so when I got inside and I, I put the door back in place, I tried a dozen or so times to swing the door at varying speeds to see if I could simulate the same thing, to see if I could make it lock itself, right, with a deadbolt. Yeah. But it never worked. It never happened. And like I said, hmm. from standing right outside the bedroom door, that distinctive sound of it sliding over and then clicking upright, right? I mean, you just can't yeah. simulate that sound. So try as yeah. I might, I couldn't, I couldn't reenact what had happened. It was just another mystery related to that house, related to that, that room, which, which happened to be my room. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I don't think at that at that house, other than that room and um, and I don't know why Gabriel had such a such a situation where I don't know if the little boy didn't like her or was just mischievous or not sure why. But other than sorry, that's my uh, my guard dogs. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you can hear them or not. Uh, yeah, a little but, uh, bit. That's okay. Yeah, um, I've got a couple of great Pyrenees. Ever since we got those dogs, we haven't had any problem with predators around our house or anything. They're just big, oh, hundred and thirty pound monster dogs. So, but uh, but yeah, other than that, I don't think we had anything like there was never uh, uh, cabinets open and closing, no you know poultry guys type activity or anything like that. You know, there was we never had anything like that going on in that house. So, but. But I did have some, I, I, I wrote in the, uh, when we were messaging, I had a really weird experience out in the Arizona desert. Hmm. And I'd like to share it because maybe some people watching this, or, uh, viewing this would have an idea of what happened to me and my hunting partner. But here's two grown men and it scared us so bad. We packed up and we left. We weren't, our hunting weekend was over as soon as the next morning hit. And uh, 
what happened was we we'd gone out and it was out in the desert near Kingman, Arizona. And this place, valley yeah. is kind of yeah, and this valley was kind of interesting. There was um there were some people that would live out there on and off in this valley, and I think they were mostly like people cooking meth type thing, you know. But uh, there was the bikers that were out there type thing. But um but nobody lived out there full time except for this uh, one armed man and his wife. And this guy uh, was an explosive expert. And uh, apparently he was the guy that taught Timothy McVeigh mm. how to do explosives and stuff. And when that whole Oklahoma City bombing happened, I mean, they said that the whole valley was lit up with law enforcement because apparently McVeigh was supposed to head out there. So they were all over the valley and, you know, approaching this guy but he had since passed and my buddy said yeah we're going to go out there and he said but uh i'll just let you know there's a lot of ufo activity out there i said okay whatever i said well maybe we'll see a ufo you know we're out on top of this little hill and there was a cabin up there and everything we had to bring our own water there was no water out there and uh i brought a six pack of beer and i think he brought uh some vodka and orange juice and so we'd done some hunting in the afternoon when we got there and we were trying to find some javelinas. I don't know if you know what those are. They're small little piglet type. Yeah, they're kind of like a, kind of like a wild boar, but a smaller version. Mm -hmm. So, so we were out hunting for them because they were in season. But it was kind of one of those let's guy get away from the wife weekend type thing, you know. <laughs> so, so we were out there. So um, we ate, we ate whatever we had hamburgers or something like that. And uh, I think I had two beers, and he had a couple of cocktails, and we retired for the night. And uh, we were joking around. I said, uh, I said, I'm not going to keep my gun here. I'm going to keep a machete because, you know, if a UFO comes in, you know, they're going to disable your firearm. So I'm keeping a machete next to me. <laughs> so so I, had our mach I had a machete next to me and I slept on the couch and it was just a small cabin. So I was on the couch and he was up in the loft sleeping up there. And uh, I got up in the middle of the night. And I was like, oh, I got to go relieve myself. So I went outside. And as soon as I started going to the bathroom, Man, a, a wave of heat came over me. I I have never experienced anything like that before or since. And I got so overheated and so hot. I mean, to the point when I stepped out on the porch, my feet were cold because it was a cold desert night. And uh, when that heat hit me, I remember the bottom of my feet felt hot. I was sweating profusely. And there was a picnic table on the porch. And I just sat down with my hands on my head like this, just like, whoa. And I was just about to call out to my friend. And I could feel that, okay, it, and it was probably maybe three or four minutes of intense heat. And I could feel myself starting to feel the atmosphere again and feel the cool desert night. And I could feel that I was starting to cool off again. Just like, wow, what the heck was that all about, you know? So um, the next morning, we went out early morning hunting. And I told my buddy, I said, hey, man, something really weird happened last night. And I started to talk about it. And he cut me off and he said, were you sweating a lot in this? And he finished the story I was going to tell him because while it was happening to me, it was happening to him up in the loft because when I came back in, he called my name. I said, it's just me. I just went to the bathroom. He goes, okay. And he told me, I was just about to let you know something was happening with me and I might need to go to the ER because he didn't know what was going on with him either. So we kind of compared notes and just went, uh, something hit us. Uh, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> so, so we left. But it's interesting that there is some sort of a army test facility, I guess, about 10 miles away as the crow flies through the desert. And um, I'm not sure what they tested out there. He said that it had something to do with tanks, like it was a tank testing ground. Um, I have no idea the name of the facility or anything like that. Maybe one of your listeners would know. But all I could figure out, I said, man, I felt like we got microwaved or something like that because it was just instant heat and then it was over with. Didn't see any craft. You know, the stars were all bright. It was a clear sky. Didn't see anything, no satellites, nothing like that. But uh, yeah, it scared the crap out of us and we got out of there. So I don't, maybe some one of your listeners would know what kind of an anomaly that was. The, the other interesting thing was there was a lot of Anastasi Indian caves up there and they would go into the caves and find artifacts. So that was another thing about that valley. So that's, that's all I got. I mean, if, if there's somebody out there that knows what that was, please <laughs> let me know. Uh, cause a couple of points, and, uh, the yeah. Anastasi. That were, was back, uh, that was back about 1999, just getting uh, into 2000. So that was quite a while ago. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I lived around that area, uh, actually further north, Bullhead City. But I, I've okay. been through Kingman many times. I, I, that's where I launched from, you know, the Greyhound buses, you know, to take trips okay. and, and what have you. So uh, mm -hmm. the Anathazi were, were alleged to be cannibals, right? They were in the oh, uh, okay. ritual murder, sacrifice, and, and eating oh. people, right? Okay. So don't know if that factors in, perhaps, but also as far as the uh, intense heat is concerned, the only thing I can liken it to in my personal experience was when I was on the receiving end of electromagnetic beaming. And uh, mm. in the uh, late afternoon going into the early evening, I started hearing you know, these popping, increasing, uh, he increasingly hearing these popping noises in the walls around me. And I began to sense this kind of uh, heat sensation, kind of a prickly heat sensation. And then hmm. I didn't think nothing of it, right? And so I, I went to sleep, and then thereafter ensued this this horrific, uh, what I now know to be mind control electromagnetic beaming experience, where I was getting electromagnetically beamed to the point where, when it intensified, I could feel beneath my scalp a certain part of my brain twitching, and then when it really intensified, my eyes would involuntarily get cross-eyed, and everything would just white out. So, wow. uh, and that happened for hours. Uh, huh. Well, so, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I talked with John Burroughs about our incident, and he um, had told me that the Department of Energy had something going on just outside of our base. And there was there was a couple of things going on. There was, um, uh, it was called Cobra Mist, and they were trying to do over the horizon, uh, I guess, radar or something like that. So they were doing some experiments um, at some facility out there. But he had mentioned that, um, that electromagnetic pulses were going on and this and that. And I said, well, maybe what I saw was something that they were putting in my brain and I didn't see a UFO. You know, and we were trying because we were just talking about what all the possibilities were and that type of thing, you know. And you got to remember, this is the height of the Cold War. So everybody was trying all sorts of stuff to counter stuff. And what great a way to... Uh, save your resources than hit a bunch of troops with electromagnetic pulses and have them think that there's an invading army and have them run away, I guess, you know, something like that. You know, I, I don't know what they were working on, but I do know that he mentioned that um, Williams was upset that they were doing stuff outside the base that was affecting people on the base. And I guess he had some, some sort of issue with that. So, oh, so um, he said he was either within earshot or somehow heard that Colonel Gordon Williams was complaining about some activity being done of like an electromagnetic nature, which seemed to have an effect on, on his command, his troops. So, something to that effect. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I, I don't know all the details about it. Cause at the time I was over in China and, um, I really just didn't really want a whole lot to do with, I don't know. I, I, actually, the only reason I kind of came out of the, the woodwork on all this was I got contacted by uh, Paul and Ben Eno when I was over in China and they wanted to do some Rendlesham Forest, you know, anniversary. And they had me and Larry and I think uh, um, Colonel Halt was on there and a couple other people. And, you know, so we had kind of a, you know, a discussion about, you know, all the events that happened. But uh, prior to that, I really didn't want anything to do with any of that. It was just such a negative on my life, you know? I mean, it mm -hmm. ruined my Air Force career. Yeah, uh, I was just pretty negative about the whole thing, you know? So, um, but that's about, and that was around 2006, I had contacted uh, Paula Harris. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I found her website and I was looking at it and I thought, well, here's somebody that actually does investigations. Because I've kind of got an issue with people that what I call are just leeches. They'll just latch onto a witness, write a book, or run them around the country doing, you know, UFO conferences and this and that, and make a bunch of money off of them and use them. And yeah. I, I just don't, I just don't take kindly to that, you know. So, um, and I'm not going to name names. There's people out there that do that, you know. But um, um, and they, all of a sudden they're experts in UFO stuff, you know. <laughs> so. Well. Well, Nick Pope was and a I, classic example of that. It's just someone who's glommed on to, to Rendlesham to make a name for himself. But, but please continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
Yeah, I, I've met Nick and uh, he seems like a personable guy and stuff like that. I don't have a problem with him personally, but professionally, um, yeah, he's uh, he's made a lot of money off of other people's backs. And, you know, for just being a desk clerk, you know, he didn't run the UFO desk. Phones would no. come into him and he'd route them to whoever, you know, yeah. he was a low level clerk. He was, he was a low level yeah. clerk. That's been proven. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever, you know. Well, a quick point anyway, about, so so so, oh, please so I never yeah. liked any people like that. <laughs> oh, I understand. I mean, either because you know, we're the yeah. ones having the experiences, and someone's you know profiting. I mean, there's people that literally have made DVDs out of some of my lectures and, and sold them. Of course, I don't oh, get really? a penny of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting yeah. point about yeah, the I, Department of Energy too. Just want to make a quick point. Uh, yeah. After World War II, General Leslie Groves wanted to preserve the capabilities of, of at least the military side of the Manhattan Project. So mm -hmm. uh, Congress set it up so it would split. There would be a civilian half, the Atomic Energy Commission, which after a number of name changes, we now know as the Department of Energy. Okay. And the military side was the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, which after a number of name changes, I think they're called the Defense Nuclear Agency or some variation thereof. And between the two, there was the Military Liaison Committee, this highly secret, uh, military organization that was part of Armed Forces Special Weapons Project at Sandia, and it was an all-service outfit, uh, members of the Navy, Army, Air Forces at the time, and the Army. Uh, General Leslie Groves headed that up, and then also General Lewis Brereton, who was a original, um, well, he was a consultant to the, the Majestic 12. You see him in some of the Majestic papers uh, as being listed as an attendee, a conference attendee. So mm -hmm. point being is that you can see in some of the majestic documents uh, dated 47, 48, especially as it relates to uh, what happened at Roswell, the aftermath at Roswell. I have no reason personally to doubt the authenticity or the validity of these particular documents. And it, it specifically mentions uh, SED special engineering detachments from Armed Forces Special Weapons Project at Sandia, who were at some of the crash sites uh, in and around Roswell, uh, Plains of St. Augustine, and other places. I think that was one of the other crash sites. So, point being is that the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project was deeply involved in the recovery and the analysis and the storage of alien technology and what have mm -hmm. you. And then you fast forward down the track, right? the sister organization of the uh, Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, Sandia National Labs now, is another name for it, is the Atomic Energy Commission. And so you have this scenario where the Atomic Energy Commission, Department of Energy, they're responsible at some level for bases like Dulce, New Mexico. They're responsible for some of these deep black spooky uh, agencies or, or operations involving alien technology, uh, involving uh, electromagnetics, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting that, that Burroughs would quote uh, Gordon Williams uh, to the effect that he, there's some kind of electromagnetic activity being conducted that's affecting his troops, and somehow the Department of Energy uh, is involved in that, which, ap which absolutely makes sense. If you track it doc from the documentation standpoint, and then also from, if you zoom back and you look at it from a, an organizational standpoint, it was a slippery slope. I mean, how did it go from, uh, you know, simply recovering alien technology to fast forward and you have these uh, these events like Rendlesham and, and these, these other similar places where this deep black interaction seems to be going on between aliens and non-human uh, non life forms on the one hand and deep black elements of the military on the other. So there was definitely mm -hmm. a process at work. It didn't happen overnight, but you can see how they set up these committees and these these steering committees to kind of set this whole thing up, you know. So um, I, I didn't know that about what, what Burroughs said. So so thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure he came up with a book um, after he did the book with uh, Jim and Nick Pope. Um, I believe he came up with another book. I haven't read it yet, but um, the last I had talked with him years ago. He said that he was going to mention something about that or go into some details and stuff. But uh, but in our talking, um, I, I had a sister who lived out in Arizona, and I happened to uh, meet up with him. So we talked face to face, and uh, and we were talking, and he said that one of the side effects of uh, getting hit with 
um, electromagnetic pulses and all that sort. He was talking about how if you get hit from different directions, one part kind of hits you and makes you susceptible to the other part hitting you and it opens up your brain where they can put stuff in it or something. That's beyond me. I, I don't know how any of that works, but, but he was talking like that. And he said that one of the, uh, one of the side effects is you get kind of aggressive and angry. And, oh yes, uh, absolutely. And, and I'll tell you, I, I even wrote about it in my book. I, after my incident, I just went off the rails. As you know, <laughs> I was an angry young man for many years after, you know, and, uh, hated life, hated people, just hated fellow man, just was one angry, evil individual for quite a few years after that, you know? And I, and I think it was just, I felt, I just felt like betrayed, you know, it was, it was kind of the big issue type, type thing. But, you know, it's That's interesting you mentioned, too. yeah, yeah. I was going to say an interesting, you mentioned uh, Roswell um, when I was talking about Paula Harris, um, she came out with a book recently called Trinity and um, she wrote it with Jacques Vallée. And there was actually an incident just before Roswell um, while World War II was going on, just as it was winding up and it happened over near the Trinity site. So um, if you've got some readers out there that are interested in that, that's it's really a good read. And I read that book cover to cover. And one of the interesting things about it was these two witnesses um, saw this craft that had a hole in it. This craft had gotten damaged. And they said that there were three entities in it and they had skin tight suits and they didn't walk. They just kind of floated through the through the vessel. And I thought, wow. When Larry told me about his incident, he said there were three entities in skin tight suits, which he said he could only, you know, mentally you know, comprehend that they were kids in snow suits is what he is his exact words he told me. And uh, he said that they just kind of floated. <laughs> and I went, wow, isn't that similar? That's pretty interesting. So, yeah. So it's very interesting to read. But that's why I like about Paula. She spent five years, maybe even more, researching that before she ever um, in, I guess, her and Jacques Vallée were looking at the incident on separate paths and they found out both the, you know, they were both studying this. So they got together and collaborated and wrote the book. And, uh, um, it, but she actually does the legwork and goes out there and studies and does her own research. And, you know, that's why I've got a lot of respect for her compared to some of the leeches. That yes. Are yes. The, I've, I've the UFO come across world. her work before and I've, I've been really impressed. Did she say, I have to read the book because I've heard about it, but there's the most mm -hmm. I've, gotten about heard about it from one person you uh did paula say that the craft was recovered by the military oh yeah oh yeah yeah without a doubt yep yeah and she she was joking about the uh um the caliber of the military that were guarding the craft because it was world war ii so um you know basically the schleps were left back at yeah. home <laughs> you know the, the the people that were good and you know worthy were out fighting and you know taking care of business so these guys were you know they'd leave the craft and they'd go to town and go drinking and come back so um apparently these two kids because all the adults were were gone and there were two young kids that were on horseback and they were in charge of the ranch and i don't know if it was sheep or cattle that they were they were working with but um so they actually watch they, they kind of snuck in waited for these guys to go to town to go drinking and then they snuck in and um looked inside the craft so I'm telling you, it's a really interesting read. I'd really encourage somebody to pick up this book and read it. And I don't know why it hasn't gotten more publicity because it it precedes Roswell. Yeah. So, and yeah. it's interesting that Ballet would take the stance because he was initially a skeptic with with Roswell. He wrote a book, Revelations, which basically, you know, in in collusion with John Keel, you know, because mm -hmm. John Keel, despite all of the great work he's done with uh, strange and abnormal creatures out of time and space he kind of had this bias against roswell and other crash retrieval events it's a whole nother story but mm -hmm. the vilification meted out to silas dean who was the contact with one or more of the scientists and engineers involved in the uh, new mexico aztec crash retrieval march 1948 which really happened now silas mm -hmm. dean had an interesting background because he was into the oil exploration business, and he developed techniques which almost guaranteed that he would get an oil strike every single time he would prospect and work for his mm -hmm. clients, right? And so mm -hmm. he was already at the top and the bottom of the hate list of the petrochemical industry. <laughs> Next thing you know, okay. he has somehow 
uh, gets involved with some of the scientists and consultants involved with the crash retrieval at Aztec, New Mexico. And the media and, and the uh, propaganda arm of, of the U.S. government really went to town. First of all, they hated Silas Dean in the first place because of his oil explorations success, you know, strike rate. Secondly, now mm-hmm. he's bringing up this information about Aztec, which would kind of make the whole petrochemical industry kind of come a part of the scene overnight. <laughs> the truth ever came out. I mean, obviously, these things aren't powered by petroleum products, right? So mm-hmm. w- what it did was it created this stigma because they just universally labeled uh, Silas Dean a hoaxer, a fraud, uh, ergo Aztec was a hoax, never happened. So for decades thereafter, a, a number of prominent researchers in the UFO field shied away from any stories about crash retrievals. Hmm. So they, they, it served their purpose to stigmatize a subject so bad that nobody would touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, to his credit, the late, great Leonard Stringfield said years after the fact, well, I may have been too hasty about Aztec, New Mexico, because it seems like, according to some of my reliable uh, sources and witnesses, it really happened, right? And then, of course, Scott Ramsey wrote the book, uh, you know, years later, and uh, I'm satisfied that that Aztec happened. But again, there's that connection because, according to the story, a number of prominent uh, scientists were flown into Durango Airfield in Colorado, bust over to Aztec, New Mexico, including one J. Robert Oppenheimer, of course, who set up hmm. the Trinity uh, test, and uh, Oppenheimer yeah. also figured prominently in the Majestic Papers. You can read the, they really look like military briefing, you know, um, message traffic type messages. And he's mentioned prominently in, in some of these documents as having been at one of the crash sites at Roswell, as well as being brought in as a consultant from the Atomic Energy Commission. At one time, he was the chairman of the General Advisory Committee to come in and inspect what was purported to be an alien reactor system, right? So he hmm. would come in and then he would he and Dr. Theodore von Karma and others who were mentioned in these documents would come and inspect the reactors and, and other components of, of the drive system and the engine, what have you, of, of some of these craft. So interesting that um, – and cycling back to Jacques Vallée, he was skeptical about Roswell. He, he wrote the, the book Revelations, basically debunking it, and he got a lot of flack from the UFO community. Uh, hmm. But now he's kind of done, done a 180 and he's talking about – how there was a craft that a crash that preceded Roswell. That's interesting. I definitely want yeah. to read that book because Paula does great research. So I'm, I'm sure there's something to yeah. this. Yeah. And she, um, I, I, I'm so bad with names. It's ridiculous. I, I think God, I mentioned that in my book. I, I think God uh, humbles you. I've got a great memory, but when it comes to names, it just, yeah, just isn't there. But um, she wrote a book about uh, an individual that um, apparently was part of the crash retrieval government unit and he retrieved five separate crafts hmm. and he he said that he had interaction with some of these beings and um that's that's a pretty good read that book as well and uh and as he was dying he died of cancer i, I believe and um he was going to transfer all his documents over to paula and uh, apparently some people came to the door and said hey we're here to pick up your documents and stuff like that and he was like uh no i don't think so but Paula didn't send you. <laughs> so he answered the door with a gun in his hand, apparently, mm. and shoot him off. You know, like, I don't think so. Get out of here, you know, and then called Paula immediately like, hey, did you just send somebody to pick up my document? She's like, no. He goes, well, somebody just came and said that you sent them and I didn't think you did. So, yeah. So it's pretty interesting to some of the some of the interactions. Um, I did. I did a podcast with her and I actually it was, wasn't a podcast. It was a radio show with her and uh, Paul and Ben Eno here about, oh, I want to say maybe three months ago. And we talked we talked specifically about that. So, Yeah, um, ask her to come on my show. I, I'd love to interview her. And uh, oh, okay. I'd, I'd love to hear the story about, uh, I'm not sure if it's the same individual uh, that I'm thinking about, but there was a colonel, the next Air Force guy. Uh, he since passed away and he was involved in something called Project Pounce, which was another code name. With these crash retrieval operations, we've heard varying names over the, over the years: Operation Moon Dust, Project Moon Dust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Was it a guy named Colonel Steve something or other that, that was involved in in, no, in crash it retrieval? Wasn't Steve. No, it wasn't Steve. And maybe when we we take our little break midway, I'll uh, get on the internet and find out what this guy's yeah. name was. Yeah, but um, yeah, 
that'd be interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she might come on. Um, I think she's on her way to Japan here pretty, pretty quick. She's going to go over there and, uh, uh, Trinity, the book was uh, translated to Japanese, so oh, they asked her to go over there and do some stuff. So she's going to be over there for a little while. So she travels around, and she's pretty disgusted in the whole UFO community in the U.S. because it's it's a sideshow circus more than it is actual always been always been like that. And, yeah, you know, I've gone to a couple conferences, and uh, I went to one up in uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, with uh, Paul Lino and. I kind of surprised them. I knew they were going to be up there. So I just kind of cruised up and like, Hey guys, what's up? You know, showed up. Cause I happened to be living in New Hampshire. It was only an hour away from my house or so. So I, I showed up and I couldn't believe the circus like had an atmosphere there. They were, 